Good evening. I am Dr. Christina West, and I am chair of the Helen Glass Research Symposium Committee. I'm really excited to welcome you here, each one of you, to this very first Helen Glass Research Symposium. This event is actually began 12 years ago. It was previously known as the Dr. Helen Glass Researcher in Residence Series. This year we had the opportunity to reimagine what was possible for this event. And this evening we are honored to be here at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, a space that was purposely made to challenge, motivate, and uplift people. As I am sure you will be aware, there are so many individuals that were part of making this event possible. I would like to thank all the members of the advisory committee, Dr. Beverly O'Connell, who is the Dean of the College of Nursing, Dr. Beverly Temple, Associate Dean of Research, as well as the external relations team at the University of Manitoba. I would also like to say a special thank you to Dr. Genevieve Thompson, who was the previous chair of the event and gave me great support as I took over this role. And finally, I want to thank Jackie Edelson. I don't think I would have made it to this day without her. <laughs> she is the administrative assistant in the Manitoba Center uh, for Nursing and Health Research. And she's just been amazing support and has had great patience with me. The symposium is hosted by the College of Nursing in honor of Dr. Helen Glass, who had a vision to bring internationally renowned researchers to the College of Nursing. Dr. Glass was a true nursing pioneer. She was an officer of the Order of Canada and a former director of the University of Manitoba School of Nursing. During her tenure, she established a graduate nursing program and she also um, established the, what we know as uh, the Manitoba Centre for Nursing and Health Research. She was also president of the Canadian Nurses Association and made a valuable contribution to the World Health Organization. Dr. Glass was unwavering in her commitment to ensure nursing's presence at the highest levels of healthcare and health research. We hope that the Helen Glass Research Symposium will provide a unique opportunity for members of the public and those committed to advancing healthcare practice and research to come together to hear innovative ideas from world-class nursing scholars. This evening, it is my great pleasure to welcome our 2017 Helen Glass Scholar, Dr. Alexander Clark, as well as Bailey Souza, who is the director of the International Institute of Qualitative Methodology. They both come to us from the Faculty of Nursing at the University of Alberta. I would now like to invite Dr. Beverly Temple to come and bring greetings to you from our Dean. As you can see, Dr. West and I are slightly different heights. <laughs> So I said it's the first thing I always do is go check the podium. So I knew right away I was going to move to the side and um, just bring greetings. So um, anyway, good evening, everyone, and welcome. Dr. O'Connell is unable to be here today, but has asked me to deliver greetings on behalf of the College of Nursing. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this 12th annual Dr. Helen Glass Research Symposium. Um, previously something else. I want to acknowledge Dr. Helen Glass's vision to support this type of program as I know firsthand how many benefits we've all experienced. We are very privileged to have Dr. Alex Clark, whom I've heard many times and I know you're going to enjoy his presentation. Dr. Clark and Bailey will continue to participate in a host of research activities at the College of Nursing from which we will all um, enjoy. It's great to see this public lecture has attracted such a large and diverse group of people from administration, education, practice, and the public. This public lecture is significant as it provides a forum for the exchange of ideas, new knowledge, which is vital for the development of the profession. We live in a dynamic and ever-changing healthcare environment that demands an agile and thinking profession whose responses to healthcare challenges are evidence-informed and serve the public in a responsible and accountable way. And it's through these forums and knowledge exchanges that we're able to deliver on the healthcare needs of tomorrow. So I'd like to also acknowledge the hard work and orga of the organizing committee, and in particular, um, Dr. West. And I know that um, 
Jackie and the rest of the team from the Manitoba Centre for Nursing and Health Research has um, worked hard to uh, present this in as smooth a way as, as, as possible. I would like to um, also acknowledge that some of the nursing faculty and, and practice may be used to having our MCNHR an annual meeting at um, this, and we, so please watch for that. We're going to do it in early May to um, reserve this to um, leave it for just the speaker this evening. Thank you, Christine. As we begin, we would like to acknowledge that we are on Treaty 1 territory, on the traditional territory of the Anish Anabi peoples and the homeland of the Métis Nation. The university and the forks of the city of Winnipeg sit at the crossroads of the Anishinaabe, Métis, Cree, Dakota, and OG Cree nations. I would now like to invite Marlene Casey's, who is our first elder in residence in the College of Nursing, to come and say a prayer about how our scholarly community might be deepened through this symposium. In asking for her guidance on behalf of the College of Nursing, I offer her the sacred gift of tobacco. Marlene? Um, I'm just uh, <coughs> preparing my notes, and I'm just, I was just worried that I, I'll go over 10 minutes. <laughs> I'm going to start by uh, introducing myself. I was always told by my people that I, that to talk about when I talk to people that I should uh, talk about who I am, where I'm from, and where I grew up. And that's what I'm going to do right now. I'll say the prayer when I'm finished with talking a little bit about my, myself. I, uh, I was born and raised in a, in a fishing lake, First Nation, in Saskatchewan from the Soto Nation. I, uh, I'm from Treaty 4. Treaty 4, it's uh, by York and Saskatchewan. There's a lot of uh, Soto people that live there. And uh, I, w I was raised in a traditional community. I, uh, there was uh, a lot of, uh, there's many elders when I was a when I was a kid, growing up, and uh, and uh, <clears throat> there was a lot of uh, of ceremonies and uh, a lot of gatherings all over, and that's where I learned uh, the teachings from. I learned my language. I was born, you know, I, I didn't know how to to speak English for till I was about eight or seven. And uh, when, my, when my dad was uh, offered tobacco, that meant we, we had to go to a ceremony. There was, uh, in my family, there was uh, 10 girls and one boy. I was the second oldest. And uh, we used to all go to the to the ceremonies. It was, uh, you know, when the ch when the seasons changed, there would be a lot of ceremonies. 
And that's where I learned my teachings, the teachings I have today. The language, as the, the teaching, the, the language is the teachings. They're all in those words. That's how I, I, that's how I know how to teach, teach the, the culture. And uh, when my dad was asked, given tobacco, that meant we were going to a ceremony. And we would get all, my mom would have a, a bunch of uh, little dresses for us to, to wear to the ceremony. And, and that was one of the happiest times I remember, was being with all the elders and everybody, everybody there. And uh, there was a lot of gatherings. There was gatherings for hunting and, and preparing meat for the winter. There was a lot of, always a lot of, you know, we all stayed together. Uh, people came to the ceremonies and, and they would camp out. And that's where we got our teachings. It, the, it was the communities that cared the children. They, uh, they, everybody, everybody saw you what you were doing. Or your people were always watching you. Your grandparents, uncles, and aunts, and sisters, and you, know, you couldn't even sneak around and do to do anything because <laughs> they were they would tell the parents. And everybody would, would you talk to you all the time. And now, uh, uh, at the when I, when my sister, my older sister, and I were, I was seven and she was nine, I think. When my uh, when uh, uh, they used to call them uh, farmer instructors. I guess they were Indian Affairs at that time. He came to our house and, and told my mom and dad that we are going to a residential school, that we had to go. My mom, he, they, he told them that if uh, we don't go, they might be in big trouble. And my mom, they were, they were scared. They didn't know what kind of trouble. My, my dad said they might go to jail. And, uh, and so uh, my mom was very upset, and my dad was comforting her, and, and they told us that, that they would write to us all the time, and they would, they, we would come home some, sometimes, and uh, we, we were abused in there. Well, I was abused. I later found out just about 20 years ago that my sister was abused too. I always thought it was only me. Uh, 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 a priest, and he was a principal. He was the one that assaulted me when I was 11 years old. I, everything changed. All my little dreams I had they didn't exist anymore because I, I had so much guilt and so much shame, and, and uh, I didn't. I didn't feel good about myself anymore. And uh, it just got worse as, you know, in the years go, went on. But that just, uh, today I uh, am healing from all those, those pains. I, I believe in, in forgiveness. I, I did, Everything I put in, everything into it to forgive my my uh, my uh, abusers and to and uh, or else I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be standing here. I'd probably be not around. But I'm glad that I'm here, and I'm so excited for the the nurses that are already. Some of them are are already nurses, and. Uh, I'm going to be asking, asking Creator for, to watch, you know, to take care of us, and and I like to start my prayer. I'll be talking in my own language, and uh, it's because it's uh, it's more meaningful 
when it's in my language. I'm going to say my, uh, my uh, spirit name, my, uh, <clears throat> my spirit name is Naugis Vega Poitamok. This is Nikas Maka Dutem. Koya Sema Ramini Kuan Chigagi Kitanuma Chandastavi, <laughs> So again, I just want to thank Marlene for being here today um, and offering that prayer. I think it's so important. And she's such an important part of our community at the College of Nursing. And very lucky are we to have her with us. And now I'm honored to introduce you to our 2017 Helen Glass Scholar, Dr. Alexander Clark. Dr. Clark is Professor and Associate Dean of Research in the Faculty of Nursing at the University of Alberta. His research draws on complexity and realist theory to understand health outcomes in heart disease, chronic disease management, and self-care. His work has been highly influential in Canada as well as on an international level. Dr. Clark holds leadership roles within the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, Heart and Stroke Foundation Canada, and he chairs the board of the International Institute of Qualitative Methodology. He is also editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Qualitative Methods. For his many professional contributions, the World Economic Forum accredited him the status of Young Scientist Global Leader in 2011. I met Dr. Clark in 2014 at a Qualitative Health Research Conference and he has had a significant influence on my own development as a researcher. He is certainly a visionary scholar and a nursing leader, but what remains with you is the humanity, creativity, and passion that he brings to his scholarship, as well as his mentorship of students and researchers, nationally and internationally. He is an engaging speaker, and I know tonight he will both challenge and inspire you. Please join me in welcoming our 2017 Helen Glass Scholar. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure and my privilege to be here from the University of Alberta to focus on talking about cardiovascular health. And when I came with my colleague Bailey Sousa from the International Institute for Qualitative Methodology from snowy and cold Edmonton, who would have thought we would come to Winnipeg for fantastic weather? <laughs> but it's great to be here and to share in the legacy of Helen Glass, this visionary pioneer, and the legacy that she's left through this renewedly regenerized research symposium. Um, and I welcome each and every one of you. I'm interested also to know who's here. So if you're an academic, hands up, academics. Welcome academics, normal people. Um, <laughs> members of the public, welcome. Particularly welcome to you and clinicians. Anyone here from government? Very important, welcome. And students. Great, the future students particularly, a really big welcome to you, and it's inspiring for me to be here. Um, 
I feel that there's quite a heightened expectation here. Let me just put that out there. And it's good to talk about cardiovascular health. And if you want to tweet, hands up who's on Twitter. Okay, so you can use the hashtag, hashtag HGRS 2017. You can tweet me in as well. And if you have any questions, talk online or talk to me afterwards over the email. Um, because like I say, I feel expectations are quite high here. And here we are in the only federal museum outside of Ottawa. And I think the best building outside of Ottawa with the best people outside of Ottawa. No pressure. And, and when I think about this pressure, I think, you know, sometimes you go into the fast food restaurant and they have a great vision of what's on the menu. And here we are. And I don't know if you can see the small wording. On the left, you have the, the representation, or on the right, you have the reality in the pictures here. <laughs> and if you can see the wording here, you can see we've had rotated to the most attractive angle. And here we have extra cheese. And I've been slightly fluffed up, I think, for the picture as well. <laughs> so I hope you're not going to be too disappointed with me this afternoon and what I have to offer. Electronic devices, I'm sure many of you have them here. But actually, today, I'm going to talk about a different electronic device that's far better than any cell phone. We tend to think of it a bit, a bit like a pump. And OK, we might think about it as the pulse of life or the force of life. But in many ways, I think our hearts are a lot different to this and a lot more than this. So what I'd like to do now is, just before we begin, I'm going to come down. And I'd just like us to just be still and breathe. Feel your breath come in and feel your breath come out. And if you want, put your hand on your heart and feel your heart beat. And if you want, you could put your heart on your carotid artery and feel your heartbeat. And just feel that life. And think about that heart. That heart that beats for 60 or 80 times a minute. That heart that will beat today for 115,000 beats. 42 million beats over the year. 3.3 billion beats over your lifetime. And know that that heart that you feel beating in this quiet space started beating not three seconds after you were born, not three minutes before you came into being, but that heart came into being three weeks after you were fertilized, when you're probably about that big. And that heart will keep beating, literally, literally, until the day you die. Hopefully, a long time away from now. Our hearts are very, very special things. And we should never forget that specialness we should never forget that magic. Even though we're familiar with the heart and we're familiar with the everyday, we can see it like a pump. But in many ways, it has this delicateness. Yes, it's the pulse of life. Yes, it's the force of life. But it's delicate. It's intricate. And sadly, it's all too vulnerable. And this is why we need to talk about cardiovascular health. And the reason the heart is so important is because it provides the circulation, it is the center for the circulation for the body. Your arteries and veins and capillaries where the blood throws to the body from the heart to the lungs, to the organs, and then back again. And what's interesting, if you stretch those arteries and capillaries and veins out into a big long string, just your 
arteries, capillaries and veins alone would go around the world not once, not twice, but two and a half times. And that's just you. It's pretty amazing. And our hearts are prone to disease, unfortunately. And we're going to talk about that disease today. In particular, a thing called coronary heart disease or cardiovascular disease. And coronary heart disease or cardiovascular disease affects the blood supply to the heart, the heart's own blood supply. And when you see one of the five main coronary arteries blown up here, we can see that these arteries are prone to blockages, blood clots, which in combination with the buildup of fatty deposits around the artery can cause a narrowing and chest pain or indeed a blockage to the coronary artery thereby stopping the blood getting to the heart. And when that happens, part of your heart is diseased and dies. And this is what happens, this blockage, when someone has coronary heart disease. Build up of fatty deposits, which in the coronary artery disease, leads to blockages of the coronary artery disease, which then causes part of the heart to die when someone has this thing called a heart attack. And many of us know people who've had heart attacks, or myocardial infarctions, and sadly, some of those people were very close to us, and sadly, some of those people died. And heart attacks through coronary heart disease are the world's biggest cause of death and disability. So if you look across the globe, this is World Health Organization data, under the title of ischemic heart disease, coronary heart disease accounts for markedly more deaths than every other condition cancer, infectious diseases, diabetes. Coronary heart disease is the world's biggest cause of death and disability. And it's not just a big cause of death and disability away from Canada, it's Canada's second leading cause of death after cancer, when you group all the cancers together. And it affects about one in 12 Canadians, a total of 2.4 million Canadian adults live with coronary heart disease. Men tend to get it a little bit younger, women a little bit older, due to the protective effects of certain hormones, but our chances of getting heart disease over our lifetime are the same. So when we think of the world's biggest cause of death and disability, what's the biggest threat to our, to my future heart health? Is it genes? Is it that it's written in the skies that I'm destined to or destined not to get heart disease? And I don't think it's genes. Is it modern times? And many of us feel stressed by modern times, eh? Yeah, you know, all the pressure, you know, to be on social media and to fulfill so many social roles and domestic roles. For sure, modern times are pressurized. But I don't think it's that stress. I don't think it's that pressure that's the biggest thing in relation to heart disease. Is it not enough healthcare. And certainly, many of our countries and many of our communities experience unequal healthcare. And this is a social issue for us all. But in the main, I don't think the biggest issue is not enough healthcare, or indeed not too much healthcare. An increasingly medicalized population. For sure, we see that around in the society about us, but I don't see that as the biggest problem. I don't even think the biggest problem is indeed a rocket science. The biggest problem for our cardiovascular health is us. It's me, it's you, it's each and every one of us. Why? Well, when I think about difficult questions, I like to reach for intellectual alumni, like Homer. Oh, this is the wrong Homer. Hold on. There. <laughs> so we're going to think about Homer and heart disease and think about misconceptions about heart disease. And I'm going to offer you some misconceptions. And our first misconception about heart disease is that only they get heart disease. Not me. I don't wake up in the morning thinking, I'm going to have a heart attack today. No one does. That heart disease is always about other people who are different than us. 
people who might look a little bit like this. <laughs> Overweight, sedentary, somewhat stressful sometimes, poor diet. It's always someone else who looks different to us. So when we think about heart disease, my question to you now is, what proportion of the people in this room do we think have heart disease? Hands up for more than 50%. Okay. Hands up for 25 to 50%. 10 to 25%? Less than 10%? Well, some of you were on the ball there. 100% of the people in this room have heart disease. It is you. Because heart disease is this lifelong process of the buildup in your coronary arteries of these fatty deposits. It's a lifelong continuum, it's a lifelong process. Now, in many high income countries, we're living longer. So our heart disease is there, but it's being manifest at a greater age. Historically in Scotland, many people died from heart disease in their mid 50s. Now people are living longer, they're developing heart disease in their mid 60s. In many countries, we're also seeing that get later and later. But the process of heart disease is a lifelong process and it's something that's relevant to each and every one of us. That's quite a sobering message that heart disease is indeed everybody's business. It is not that only they get heart disease. It is that heart disease is about all of us. No matter what age we are, no matter what sex we are, no matter what race or where we live, heart disease is about all of us. Okay, second misconception. Interesting photograph. Heart disease is a man's disease. We've seen this historically. Well, actually, heart disease isn't a man's disease. More women, in fact, die each year from coronary heart disease than men. It's just that they tend to die when they're a little bit older. And sometimes the way we think about health risks can affect the way that we see and the way that we deal with them in our everyday lives. It can be quite shocking to us that women are 10 times more likely to die of heart disease than breast cancer, 10 times. And this has led many health professionals and health promotion bodies all over the world to really try and draw attention to women's risk for heart disease. And thinking about the numbers here is quite astonishing. Here's another number more than 10, it's 33,000. That represents the Canadian women who die each year from heart disease. And they're 60% more likely than men to also die after a heart attack. We still are trying to understand why. This number rises to 50% if you just look at the first year. And nine out of every 10, 90% of Canadian women have at least one significant risk factor for heart disease. Heart disease in North America is our number one killer of women. And so it's important that we do get our heart checked, like this health promotion campaign from the American Heart Association testifies. That's not just for old people. It's for middle-aged and young people as well, because we see heart disease increasingly prevalent, getting picked up more in middle-aged people, such as this lady here who's featured in the Fight the Lady Killer Orb campaign. And ladies, women from different backgrounds as well, suffer with the very real and very negative consequences in their families as well of the fact that heart disease is the world's biggest lady killer. So, heart disease is not a man's disease. Unfortunately, heart disease is all about equality. We shouldn't forget that. Okay, let's move on to misconception number three. Heart disease is a hashtag first world problem. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of the concept of first world problems. Problems that are problems of luxury in lots of ways. Here's an, a common first world problem that some of us experience. My cookie is too big for my milk. It's 
bad. This one I found particularly disturbing and distressing. Sorry, but we may have moved your seat when we cleaned your Mercedes. How will we cope? How will we go on? And I actually caught myself saying one of these as I flew from London to Edmonton recently, my in-flight Wi-Fi was a little too slow. Like I call myself saying that. As I flew at 42,000 feet at 500 miles an hour in the safest part of my day, I was irritated because my in-flight Wi-Fi was oh, a little too slow. So we can think of heart disease as a first world problem. We think of it like this. It's a disease of urbanization. It's a disease of affluence, of society's gains over the years. But unfortunately, if we look at heart disease this very day over the world, we can see that the main cause of death, not just in affluent countries, but in middle and also lower income countries, is heart disease as well. Heart disease is not just a first world problem. Heart disease is a global problem. And more than that, it may surprise you to see just what the level of that burden is. When we look at the millions of deaths from heart disease in the red here, in high income countries compared to low and middle, the actual burden in low and middle income countries in absolute terms is about five to six times higher because population sizes are big in these countries compared to developed countries. If we look at illness in terms of, this is a thing called disability adjusted life years, the actual burden of disease in low and middle income countries is more than seven times higher compared to high income countries. And this is borne out in other WHO data here showing that in low and middle income countries, again, heart disease is the king of the castle. It is the biggest cause of death. Nor is this gonna change, unfortunately. And as we face the future, as we each face the future with our children and our grandchildren, we're gonna see heart disease continue to grow more than other diseases. Cardiovascular disease, heart attack here, and uh, cerebrovascular disease are all the diseases that are projected to grow most until 2025. What's also concerning for us as taxpayers is the volume of taxpayers that can provide care to this large and growing population is also going down in the world but in more developed regions, least developed regions, and lowest developed regions. The proportion of taxpayers to fund health care is going down over time. So this just isn't a problem, it's a very challenging problem. And some of our most challenging problems are not just far away. Some of our most challenging problems are very, very close to us. When we look at indigenous peoples, Aboriginal peoples, and I think this province has really um, developed a, a greater awareness about the cardiovascular needs of indigenous peoples. Some of the statistics can be quite disturbing for us that this happens in our country. Where we look for here, for example, at the incidence of heart disease, this is based on hospital data. In high Aboriginal population areas and low, we see markedly higher, almost 50% higher rates of disease in our Aboriginal populations. What's also challenging with these populations is they tend to have a lower healthcare access. Data here to show that in low Aboriginal areas, you tend to be closer to a hospital. But in high First Nations areas, your distance from a specialist care site goes up. And this creates real challenges for us in how we can address and provide healthcare to diverse populations, but recognizing that life opportunities Canadians should not be based on where you were born, should not be based on your heritage. We all have a human right to healthcare and to achieve the best possibility and life opportunities over our life course. So our misconception, heart disease, uh -uh, it's not a first world problem. Heart disease is a global problem in many, many ways, shapes and forms. Okay, penultimately, misconception number four. Heart disease is caused by bad genes. And actually, heart disease is not caused by bad genes, at least not alone. 
And many of us know this. We know that certain behaviors, sedentary behaviors and sedentary lifestyles are associated with a higher cardiovascular risk, often because of risk factors cluster, like bad diet and sedentary behavior. And this is a great study called the Interheart Study, which is a big, big study of populations from all over the world, 52 different countries, that looked at various risk factors associated with heart attack. Four years that happened at the turn of the millennium. And those of us who like stats can see here that if you're a smoker or diabetes or hypertension or you have obesity, you are roughly double as likely to develop heart disease. Whereas if you eat sufficient fruit and vegetables, you exercise regularly, and you have some alcohol intake and low cholesterol, you see maybe a 25 or a 30% reduction in your risk of heart disease. So we know that certain behaviors increase the likelihood of heart disease and certain behaviors decrease the likelihood of heart disease. And the golden rule here is to engage in certain behaviors, healthy behaviors and healthy lifestyles. What does that look like? Well, smoking is the most obvious one. And we know that smoking is, if you like, the most influential predictor of adverse heart health. And if you smoke, try to stop. And if you can't stop, try to reduce your cigarette consumption. We know in Canada and many countries, people are smoking less and less. But we also have to understand sometimes the context that people started to smoke. And when you look back 50, 60, or 70 years, smoking was more normal and more acceptable. And some of the advertisements here are quite shocking. This is an advertisement from the 1950s where babies are used with normalized views of women Gee, mommy, you should enjoy your Marlboro. Exploiting children and women in order to sell cigarettes. And not only babies, when you go back to the 1930s, believe it or not, physicians were also used to be advocates for smoking. Physicians say luckies are less irritating. And if babies and physicians couldn't be exploitative enough, even Santa Claus, <laughs> even Santa, was expropriated to make an argument for smoking. But from large studies, we know more that, and we know that smoking is not good for you, and if you can stop, you should stop if you want to live a longer and a healthier life. That applies to many other things as well. A diet that's high in saturated fat, a diet that's high in fruit and vegetables and pulses can reduce, conversely, your risk of developing coronary heart disease. If you exercise regularly, just can be walking to the point that you're out of breath. Almost within one to two weeks, you can experience a significant reduction in your cardiovascular risk. Now, often when I do talks like this, the hot question is, so what about wine? What about the alcohol? And it was great to see everybody enjoying one or two drinks earlier on. Because those one or two drinks provided your cardiovascular risk reduction of the day. Because if you look at the meta-analyses, and this is the largest meta-analysis to date that was in the British Medical Journal um, a few years ago, um, you look at all these big, big studies. When you look at all these studies together, we can identify that around alcohol consumption, one to two drinks a day will reduce your heart disease risk by about 25% in terms of death and also incidence. And we have this incorporated in our Canadian guidance. So if you look at the Canadian recommendations for lifestyle and behavior, low risk lifestyles for maintaining healthy body weight include diet, regular physical activity, moderate alcohol consumption, and moderate sleep duration. So yes, you can have your one and two glasses a day based on recent and latest research evidence. It's good, eh? Good news. It's not just physical things as well, and that's also really important. Mental well-being also is influential in terms of cardiovascular disease. Anxiety, depression, clinical depression, and depressive symptoms are all common. Um, and can be treated and are independent cardiovascular risk factors. Anxiety and hostility, um, more than type A behavior traditionally, the kind of hostile personality is now associated also with heightened cardiovascular risk. And also some of the studies from London have identified that having a job we have low control over also heightens your cardiovascular risk. And also it's important to recognize that living in poverty itself can exacerbate, but also be an independent risk factor here for the psychosocial risks. Do not underestimate, it's important not to underestimate the level and influence of these risks. And when we look at studies done in science 
about the relative size of risk associated with smoking and diabetes and um, different types of blood cholesterol, we see that depressed mood has a similar effect on heightening cardiovascular risk as these other behaviors. So mental health is as important in terms of depressed mood as these other healthy behaviors. More than that, if you have a severe mental health issue like clinical depression, the actual effect on your cardiovascular risk can be even greater than these other behavioral risk factors. So we cannot underestimate the influence of psychosocial factors like depression in its various forms, anxiety and hostility on our cardiovascular risk. And remember that heart disease is not only caused by bad genes, it is caused by changeable physical and psychosocial risk factors more than that. Okay, we're in the penultimate stretch of our misconceptions. I'm pretty healthy, misconception number five. So I'm just gonna be fine. The stories we tell ourselves to make ourselves feel better. Okay, my cholesterol and blood pressure is high, but I'm not overweight and I don't smoke. Therefore, I'm gonna be fine. The challenge here is that having risk factors in isolation, when you have more than one, those risk factors multiply each other. They don't just add and they certainly don't counteract and imbalance each other out. So when we look at the science here around people who've got single risk factors like smoking or diabetes or hypertension or blood cholesterol, people who've got these risk factors and that's their only risk factor, they might have a two or three times heightened risk of heart disease. However, when you start to combine these risk factors, you see a big jump, a 16 fold increase if you smoke, have diabetes and hypertension. And when you add obesity in that, you move to something in the region of a 42 fold jump. And then in addition to obesity, you have psychosocial risk factors. We see the risk factor increase by three fold again. So risk factors don't just add, they certainly don't cancel each other out, they actually compound each other. So two risk factors that you actually have in moderation can actually lead to quite a high level of cardiovascular risk. And we have to be very careful of the stories we tell ourselves because risk factors compound. They don't just add. Okay, finally in our misconceptions, and, and we experience this kind of concept a lot in our life, that the exception makes it all wrong. The people who've done science for decades with thousands and millions of people, but when that doesn't add up with personal experience or particular cases, then that really undermines the evidence, the scientific evidence. And many of us have had people in our lives who seem to be unhealthy but lived a long time. But what about old Uncle Jim? And many of us knew an old Uncle Jim. An old Uncle Jim tended to drink lots and smoke heavily and never exercised and was extremely hostile and died at 95. <laughs> and therefore, none of this science, none of these risk factors make sense. And this is a, a really challenging issue for scientists when we take big studies and when we bring them down to the individual level. So the best way to think about this in many ways is that risk and disease is kind of like a horse race. And it's a game of probability. Sometimes the horse that looks least likely to win, wins. Sometimes the favorite comes last. But the key thing is in both those situations that seldom happens. What's far more likely to happen is the favorite's gonna win because that's probability. So for sure we can't do away with probability, but the one thing we can control and influence is that probability in and of our own lives and our own cardiovascular risks. And to recognize that cardiovascular risk and heart disease risk is not about the exceptions, unfortunately. It's about the science. And it's about applying that science to ourselves in our own health. Heart disease is about us. It's about women as much as men. It is a global problem. And it's about physical and psychosocial health caused by compounding risks and not about the exceptions. It's about known risk factors. Okay, so I feel this is a slight depressing note to end the evening on. So we should take some time to reflect. 
And we should take some time to reflect on some great news. And the great news is it's never too early. And also it's never too late to lower your cardiovascular risk. Whether you're five years of age or 105 years of age, you can experience very quick and very real gains in your cardiovascular health by doing some relatively simple things. And we've indulged in some of that already this evening. But there's other things we can do. Don't smoke or reduce smoking if you can't give up. Many more therapies, nicotine replacement therapies to help us do that now. There's one thing you could do if you do smoke to lessen your cardiovascular risk, it is stop smoking. Engage in regular physical activity, ideally 30 minutes most days. Now you can think of this as the 30 minutes of exercise a day regime, or alternatively, you can think about it as the 23.5 sedentary regime. So if you put that 23 and a half hours of being sedentary in a day, you're doing a good job. <laughs> just keep, make sure that the other half hour is engaged in physical activity. That's just 2% of your day. Many of us say we don't have enough time. The reality is that's kind of saying it's not a priority for me. But if you can't take 2% of your day for your cardiovascular health, thinking about priorities would be important. Okay. Take the stairs. Simple things you can do if you can't take half hour on your treadmill or a treadmill in a gym or something in your recreational facility. Take the stairs more often. Promise yourself I will never use the elevator again. And incorporate that into your daily physical activity. You can watch TV and play TV commercial workout where you can do certain exercises with certain surprising ads. Incorporate in your daily life is very, very important and very, very useful. And sometimes the challenge can be that, you know, if we don't do that, it's very alien to us. And it's about finding things that work for you. And around healthy eating, there are different ways you can choose healthy alternatives. And whilst it doesn't always have to be the ideal five or even ten portions of fruit and vegetable a day, finding healthy alternatives. So rather than having a chocolate bar, have a chocolate mousse or a low-fat chocolate mousse. Find different ways where you can indulge your taste buds, but with healthy alternatives. But if at all possible, if you can, engage in regular eating of fruit and vegetables. Thinking not only about what you eat, but also about portion size. Thinking about the proportion of vegetables on your plate, which should ideally be half, compared to the meat, fish, or poultry you have, and the carbohydrate you have. And if you want a readily useful guide about how big your meat should be on your plate, ideally the size of a pack of cards. We like big steaks, but the recommended daily intake of meat, no bigger than a pack of cards if you want to promote your cardiovascular health. There's also things you can do in a smart and quirky way to trick your brain. The Del Boeuf illusion, whereby you can look at the two spots here and think, well, which is the biggest spot? Is it the one on the left or the one on the right? Difficult. They're actually the same size. You can apply that every day in your life. Which is the bigger plate of food, the one on the left or the one on the right? Actually, they're the same size. Use a smaller plate, it looks more. One of the things that I do at home, it's a special free tip, I actually eat my uh, breakfast and my dinner with smaller utensils. So I eat my breakfast with a teaspoon because I'm liable if I've got a big spoon. Just so eat it with a teaspoon, it takes longer, it slows you down, but it makes you more satisfied at the end of it. So doing simple things like thinking about your plate size, thinking about your utensil size can make a big, big difference. Okay, we mentioned psychosocial health and mental health and well-being are important as well. And some of us, when we think about mental health and well-being, we can think of it a bit like this. It's a bit zen, it's a bit for everyone else, and it's not like us. It's like Gwyneth Paltrow. <laughs> and that can be off-putting for some of us. And it doesn't have to be like that. And mental health and well-being and having good mental health well-being often is about taking time out from work or the usual stresses and strains of life and being with the people who you love and the people who you know and spending quality time. And thinking about giving your time and your presence to being in the moment. Trying to be active in your environment. Focusing on keeping learning, embracing new experiences, new opportunities connecting, talking, and listening with other people, and just being in that place 
where you slow down and take notice of the people and the places and the wonderful things that are around us every single day. And whilst there's medicines we can take to improve our well-being, and there's behaviors that we can do to engage in our well-being, there's many, many things that many of us can do, no matter what our circumstances are, to help support good mental health and ensure good mental health and good physical health as well. So these are the, some of the things we can do. And if you engage in these behaviors and choices, you'll see the benefits not in three years, not in three months, but in about three weeks for real heart health benefits on that most precious of organs that you've been carrying about with you from three weeks since you were fertilized and ensuring that that heart with all its vulnerability and its intricateness can stay in good health until the day that we depart this earth. So what is heart disease? So it's about us, it's women as much as men, it's a global problem. It's about physical and psychosocial health. It's caused by compounding risks. It's not about the exceptions. Heart disease is indeed everybody's business. And the one thing we can remember, as I conclude, is that it's never too early and it's never too late to start. Thank you very much. So I want to thank Dr. Clark for a very engaging um, talk. And what I love about him is he's always very entertaining. And that allows us to hear the messages, I think, in a different way. So I'd really like to invite everybody now, if you have a question or if you have a comment, um, we'd like to give you the opportunity to ask those. Um, what we would like is if you have a question or comment, if you can let us know who you're, what your name is and um, a little bit about your background. Are you a member of the public or an academic or a clinician? That would be really helpful. And Bev has a microphone here, so she'll be coming around. So just let her know uh, if you have a question or comment. My name is Sheldon, member of the public. Just you didn't talk about what type of exercise. Is there any type of exercise that's better than another? Thanks, Sheldon. It's a great question. Um, generally, when we think about exercise, we think that there's two different types of exercise. There's um, strength training where you can build muscle, and there's cardiovascular exercise where you can get your heart working. And uh, I've done some research, and other people have done research, to look at the benefits of these two different types of exercise on your heart health and your heart performance. On the whole, there is more evidence for the benefits of the cardiovascular exercise. The kind of exercise like running or jogging or walking um, or playing a sport where you feel yourself breathing. And the evidence there is strong that that improves your heart function um, with very, very clear biological changes that then lead to very clear benefits for how long you live for how well you live in terms of your mental health and for how healthy you live as well. The other evidence around strength training is not as strong because it's not been looked at as much. Again, all the evidence would point there to the benefits of strength training for building your heart up and ensuring that you can engage in a healthy lifestyle. So I'd say it doesn't have to be an either or, it can be both, but ideally cardiovascular exercise, the walking, the running, the jogging, the sport, is the one that's more realistic and more doable for many people to engage in. Thank you. Uh, my name is Emerald Ballard and I'm an academic. Yeah, my question, uh, uh, I will not give you a question, uh, but I want your thoughts. Uh, my community is evacuated, and uh, the research we're doing is about evacuees. And um, it's going to be six years that they've been evacuated, and uh, they're under a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety. Okay, what are your thoughts about their heart uh, disease? 
you know, like a prolonged term, etc. Yes. So the research evidence would say that uh, people who have experienced um, difficult uh, personal experiences sometimes can have post-traumatic stress disorder, which is linked in some studies to heightened risk of heart disease. And difficult experiences at any stage in life can be associated with higher levels of depression, higher levels of anxiety. Um, the experiences of that, the human experience of that, the reality of it is very real. And there's different things that can be done. So first of all, addressing the underlying root causes of the anxiety or depression um, in terms of environment, but also there are treatments available, whether they're medicines, also different ways to think about your circumstances. Um, also addressing the underlying, we talk about the underlying issues associated with poverty, housing as well that are important. So I would say a joined up approach is preferable, whereby we take the best of medicines, uh, the best of lifestyle advice, and the best of cognitive therapies for how we think about things, but also working with government to address the underlying issues. It's very important and it will impact on people's life expectancy and life quality. Thank you, Alex, for a very enlightening uh, presentation. I'd like to address more the psychological uh, perspective of this. Um, having experienced my own spouse who had a very significant myocardial infarction and speaking just in generally with friends and family and as you said, uh, people who sort of sit, pick out the one element or the one uncle or aunt who lived. You recommend various you know, behavioral and lifestyle changes, and yet the reality is, is denial is a huge defense mechanism that we as human beings carry towards any chronic illness. Can you address or speak to, does the research speak to um, how to move beyond the denial, how to, um, how to address that differently um, because some, in some ways your presentation is already speaking to the reverted to those of us who understand, but the multiplicity of human beings, they don't. They carry on in their lives. So can you either, does the research address denial or behavioral defense patterns or do you have your own experiences um, that you can speak to this psychological issue. Thank you. Um, so I have both experiences and also can talk about the research. So as part of my PhD, I would go and talk to people about 48 hours after they were admitted to hospital with a heart attack. And then I went to see them one week, one month, and three months later and also talked to them and listened and tried to understand how they saw the world. And what was very clear then is when you were in hospital with someone, and people in my study, some were in their 30s all the way up to their 70s. That was the time where they really did embrace the diagnosis of a heart attack. And they saw that they dodged a bullet and they were quite traumatized about what had happened to them. But when I went to talk to them subsequently, when they went back home and they went back to their normal environment, and their normal lifestyles and patterns, it's like that experience of heart attack and heart disease faded away. And their other reasoning became, well, you know, my pain went away so quickly. Maybe I didn't have a heart attack. And the reason their pain went away was because they had pain reduction medications. But it was the story that they told themselves to make themselves feel better because the reality is in our high-income country, we associate heart attacks with death and disability. And the notion, the concept of having a heart attack fills most of us with dread if it's ourselves or a loved one. So this is a very real human experience that's difficult to really comprehend. And I think when you're a health professional, to always recognize that you might see 30 people with heart attacks in one day. 
but every single patient, every single caregiver or family member's reality, that could be the first time. It usually is the first time that's happened to them. And their journey is a journey of uncertainty, of different assumptions that we have to do our best as professionals to address and work with them. So health professionals, I think, at any stage from that initial admission to hospital all the way through into family medicine can make a difference. Listening to patients, listening to caregivers and understanding is really important. Sometimes denial for sure does happen, maybe 40% of cases, but we don't realize it's happening because we don't listen and ask patients. What is it you're going through? What do you think's happened to you? So ensuring that the way we interact in our interventions are based and predicated on listening. And then ensuring that our patients can get opportunities to find out more, but also to engage and meet with other patients who can then make them more readily to assimilate the identity of someone who's had heart disease, but then work and engage in behavioral change to become again a member of society who doesn't always think about that. Because that can be the other converse of denial as well. But listening, using health services well, uh, and as health professionals, I think working together in a multidisciplinary way can be something that makes a real difference. And I would come back, my final point would be the role and influence of family. You have such a role in providing care and support, and we as health professionals need to involve you in care to ensure you get the support because you can be the person who makes the biggest difference. Hi, Dr. Clark. My name is Ron Van Inneker. I'm an administrator with the uh, uh, with one of the health authorities. Uh, thank you. It's been it was a great presentation. My question for you is. It's great to know all about those uh, those uh, ways of avoiding the risk factors, but uh, inevitably sometimes it does happen. My question is around actually carrying aspirin, and does the research talk about uh, effectiveness? Thank you for your question. It's an important question. and You will probably see in the newspapers on the internet often um, Research that suggests that aspirin can be beneficial for you at different stages in life around stroke, which is caused by a similar process as heart disease or heart disease itself. Um, and I know this because my father, again, he has atrial fibrillation, which is a type of heart problem, and he has a decision whether to take aspirin or warfarin. And aspirin on the whole is a medicine that's associated with low risks. So all drugs, all medicines are associated with risks as well as benefits. And aspirin on the whole has low risks and it does have some benefits. Um, we don't know necessarily the effect of long-term administration, taking aspirin yourself over the long term. But the research evidence would suggest that you can lower your risk for heart and stroke by, if you like, preventively taking an aspirin, particularly when you get to your 50s and 60s where your chances of a heart disease episode is higher. So my personal view, and I think the view of the science would be, yes, there are benefits and the risks are relatively low. He was also wondering about um, if when you immediately had chest pain, if someone... Yes. So let me say this very pointedly. If you think you're having a heart attack, if you think you've got chest pain, or you've got pain radiating down your shoulder to your hand, no matter your age or sex, you should seek medical attention quickly, ideally by calling 911. 60% of people with heart attacks die before they get to hospital. The world is full of dead people who didn't want to bother the doctor, or didn't want to bother the ambulance people, or didn't want to bother their spouse. Call 911. The people in the emergency room will be delighted to see you. You will get best care quickly because you're the type of people they want to go to the emergency room. So absolutely, seek medical help quickly. Remember those dead people's tales of not wanting to bother the doctor. Hi, my name is Sylvia. I'm a um, member of the public here tonight. Um, this but I work at the University of Manitoba, so I was aware of this uh, uh, symposium. Um, 
my question is, my father had a stroke at the age of 36 years old, which left him paralyzed on the right side and could not work for the rest of his life. And then he had um, an embolism to the brain when he was 60, which then left him in a nursing home. So I've dealt with a lot of heart issues in our family. And um, my concern is, stroke, people don't understand that just because you're not worried about a heart attack, stroke is very, very imminent or, or can happen to anybody at any age. And my question is, is so my father had a stroke, but could he have had, like, is it part and the same as a heart attack? Um, because, I mean, you get symptoms when you're having a stroke also, and they sometimes mimic a heart attack. And some, like you said, some people don't want it. They just think it's numbness in the arm or whatever. Um, yeah, so I just want a little bit more information on that, please. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, two things I would address in what, in what you're saying. Um, um, firstly, um, absolutely Heart and Stroke Foundation Canada, many, many organizations, government, are aware of the need for us all to understand stroke symptoms more and to encourage prompt help seeking, ideally from 911 from the emergency room, if you believe you're having a stroke. And you'll see some prominent media campaigns to raise awareness of stroke symptoms. And so just as we're, we're pretty much aware now of what the symptoms of heart attacks are, we need to be more aware of what the symptoms of stroke are as well. And as a society, support each other to seek help quickly if we think we're having a stroke by offering advice and support and uh, prompt medical seeking. Secondly, the risk factors for heart disease are the same as the risk factors for stroke. So the good news is, if you engage in the different behaviors that I talked about and the psychosocial factors as well, you'll not only reduce your heart attack risk, you'll also reduce your stroke risk and you'll also reduce your risk for almost and every type of cancer. It's a triple word score. So engage in these lifestyle behaviors. There's good news, not just for heart attack, but also for stroke and for cancer as well. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Clark, for an informative and entertaining presentation. Uh, I'm Linda Belneves. I am a new faculty member at the University of Manitoba. Um, I had a quick question about um, traditional Aboriginal diets, and there's been some controversy over the years in terms of whether the recommendations that we've had about reducing protein, increasing fruits and vegetables, and how that fits with a traditional Aboriginal diet that tends to be higher in fat as well as higher in protein. And there was some work by Dr. Jay Wartman at UBC, uh, particularly related to more diabetes, but also about obesity. I just wondered what your thoughts were about that. Yes, I think this is an area where the, the research is still catching up with culture and the way people live and the way they've lived for generations. And I think we see that in Canada in First Nations populations. In the UK as well, we see it in uh, Indian and Pakistani populations as well, where the diet that people traditionally associate their culture with um, does contain high levels of salt, or fat, or historically, you know, because access was lower, fruit and vegetables. Um, so dietitians, I think, in these circumstances would try to encourage um, healthy alternatives that also are culturally appropriate. So finding different ways where you can incorporate accessible, affordable, but also healthier alternatives into diet. This, for instance, happened in Scotland where, you know, many uh, seniors have quite traditional diets and they don't want to give up their traditional soup, as we would call it, their scotch broth. Their scotch broth, which is high in salt. So rather than the dietitians saying, well, you, you can't have scotch broth, the dietitians would try to work and develop healthier scotch broth recipes, and then work with populations, ensuring that they had affordable ingredients and skills associated with the recipes and the cooking but also to integrate those more healthier recipes to ensure that they could then still be culturally appropriate but consume a healthier diet. So I think responsiveness to culture, integration evidence with uh, everyday living are the ways forward here. 
Hello, I'm Josie, I'm a master's student at the university. My question comes to my clinical practice. I was wondering if there is a correlation between um, increased bulky muscle mass and coronary artery health, because I've seen particularly gentlemen present to the department with a large bulky muscle mass, and then they've progressed to have a heart attack. Interesting. It's always hard to comment on individual cases. and I, I think the best thing to do is to look at someone's risk factor profile. And there are calculators you can get where you can calculate someone's, and you can do this for yourself on the internet if you choose to do so. You can calculate your five-year probability of having a heart attack or heart disease. So I would always come back to what the scientific evidence would say and what the risk factors were in relation to this. Um, I'm not aware of any research associated with that bulky muscle mass, but there may be other factors that we don't know about that's causing the risk factor increase. Okay, I think we have all the questions. Oh no, you're stuck with me uh. still. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Clark. Thank you very much for your presentation. I, I think that needs to be a rolling presentation in clinical practice waiting rooms. Um, but my question is kind of related to that, and, and I'd ask you to think about this from a patient education perspective, which is my area of interest. Um, we sat and listened for 30 minutes. Most clinicians don't have that kind of time to spend with, their, with the patients who have not just have had heart attacks, but the risk factors. What would you suggest as a first step towards um, educating a patient towards some of these ideas you presented here? It's a great question. I think there's lots of different ways. Um, information is only part of the solution. So most of us, believe it or not, don't behave based on the information we've got. We know the benefits of physical activity, but life gets in the way. So information is important, but we're not all very rational calculators of maximizing benefit. Life gets in the way, priorities get in the way, many other factors get in the way. So when you start to look at health promotion and health education within that broader view, that there are many, many, we would say, determinants of health, your approach to solving those issues need to be far more integrated. So I would say, what can we do in relation to patients? We can work with government around urban planning to try to prevent more heart disease and stroke in our environments and cancer too. Um, we can work with our schools to encourage the establishment and awareness of healthy eating patterns, good mental health, early in the life course. We can work with you mums and workplaces to ensure that during middle age that the girth is not growing and that we're still engaging in those healthy behaviors and healthy lifestyles. And the tip of the iceberg, which is really the patients who we see in hospitals. Working in multidisciplinary teams, I think, is really important. That we can all play a role in this. And then coming back to a point I made earlier, working collaboratively with patients and families to work together for heart-healthy futures. This is my vision of the future. Everybody. Thank you again, Dr. Clark, for um, a wonderful evening and lots of wonderful questions now. Um, I will need to finish up for now, um, but I'm going to invite you to, uh, the bar will stay open for 10 more minutes. So if you would like another heart healthy um, <laughs> benefit, you need to get back there soon. Sorry, we couldn't extend it beyond 8 o'clock. And the tours for the museum, for those who want to partake in that, if you could meet just at the back on the left-hand side. And if you don't have cash with you, there's an ATM machine just around the corner. So I'm finishing. I just really want to thank each one of you for coming tonight. It's really exciting for us to move this event uh, here to the museum. And each of you has made this a very special event. And I know Dr. Clark will be here. So if you have more questions or comments, or would like to engage with him in more dialogue, you're very welcome to do that as we continue. So thank you again, and have a lovely evening.